Howdy all, grab yourselves a beer. It is time for some Path of Exile discussion and the new revamped Champion Ascendancy was revealed about 10 hours ago today. I wanted to go through it, just first if you've never played a Champion, there are a balance of offense and defense. Where the Juggernaut is a very defensively oriented melee Ascendancy, uh, the Occultist is a very different type of defensive Ascendancy, one that can be used with melee, uh, and the Berserker is full on offense, the Champion balances the two quite well. Previously, it was better than the old Berserker, so the 3.6 Berserker in damage output. So it did quite su substantial damage, and does so whilst also providing some powerful defensive bonuses and some nice utility. It's been a bit of a quiet start. Uh, it's actually been a very good ascendancy for quite a while, and that's why there's only been minor changes around the edges. So I want to discuss the changes first, then the unchanged nodes second, and the build ideas last. It's too early for full builds, uh, that is going to rely upon the passive tree and 2020 gem information that is yet to arrive, uh, but I can do some initial speculation. I do want to point out that nothing forces the champion into melee. It can be used fine with bows, uh, with a bow dealing the damage, or it can even be used with Herald of Agony, where you are triggering the Herald of Agony stacks via either using a bow to attack or by using melee strikes to attack. One very impactful node, and it's one that pretty much every champion takes, uh, is Worthy Foe. And this is just worth calling out because it ensures that you don't miss. Now, this meant that champion lost a little bit of favour when enemies cannot evade was made a lot easier to acquire in the Betrayal expansion. It's now widely accessible, but exp albeit expensive, benchcraft. But the Ascendancy is still every bit as good as it was before that, was, uh, before that change was made, and before that it was the best melee Ascendancy. So let's go through node by node, starting with the changes. So first up we have Master of Metal. This is the Impale themed node, and it has been made a little bit better in the, uh, in the 3.7 expansion. So Impale adds 50% more damage to hits than Impale, but only in long fights. So the enemy, if the enemy is one shot by your attack, you're not getting any benefit from Impale. Likewise, if you're Enemy, let's say your enemy has 15,000 hit points and you hit it for 12,000. Even if you register an impale there, that doesn't actually benefit you very much. You smash it for 12,000, then your next attack comes in, you hit it for 12,000, you get some extra damage from that impale, but it just means you're doing more overkill. However, if the fight was much longer, if that monster had 10 million hit points, uh, suddenly impale can add 50% more damage to every hit that impales. That's without Master of Metal. When you've got Master of Metal, uh, it changes to 70%, and it also adds more chance to Impale. So you're getting... Uh, let me actually be more technically precise. It adds 20% uh, chance to Impale. Let's not use the word more because it's not a more multiplier. Now, this node also now scale, uh, adds flat physical damage to your attacks. This scales Voidforge and Doomfletch Prism and Facebreaker very, very, very well. Flat physical damage is extremely powerful on those weapons. I do want to apologise and say that I mistakenly believed that this scaled very well on Starforge on the Berserker video. Uh, I can now confirm that it doesn't. It still helps Starforge, but it's not amazingly scaled the way that it is on Voidforge, Doomfletch Prism, or Facebreaker. Basically, any build that multiplies the physical damage as something else. So Facebreaker adds a 600 to 800% increased damage to your unarmed attacks, uh, sorry, 600 to 800% more damage to unarmed attacks, and Voidforge adds 300% of uh, physical damage as damage of a random element. So these weapons both would work very well with Master of Metal if you're striking an enemy that's already been impaled multiple times. Now, judging how good this is going to be is going to come down to how much support there is for impale on the regular passive tree. At the moment, I can't give a definitive answer on that question, uh, but I do want to also say this node picked up a very nice little conditional 1000 armor buff. Now, at endgame, 1000 armor doesn't do a large amount, except against exploding porcupines, especially in lower tier maps. However, while you are level leveling, 1000 armor is incredible. If you elect to take Master of Metal on your build, it should be one of the first or second ascendancies that you take. In fact, it'll be your second one probably because uh, Unstoppable Hero, which we'll get to quite a bit later, is even better at Normal Labyrinth. 
But just keep that in mind. That is an extremely powerful effect while you're leveling. Uh, it means that most of the dangerous physical hits that you'll suffer while you're leveling, you'll be able to laugh off. Next that was changed is First to Strike, Last to Fall. Now, this has maintained its core identity of granting adrenaline for 20 seconds when you reach low life if you didn't already have adrenaline. Adrenaline is an extraordinarily powerful buff. So let's just go through adrenaline first. 100% increased damage. That's flat damage that applies to everything. Uh, that's physical, that's melee, that's um, spellcaster, whatever. 20% increased attack, cast, and movement speed and 10% increased physical damage reduction. So that's a massive buff to last for 20 seconds. Additionally, your hits permanently intimidate enemies that are on full life, and intimidated enemies take 10% increased attack damage. Because this isn't 10% a 10% increase to your damage, it's a 10% increase to damage suffered by the monster. It actually works as a more multiplier, uh, albeit one that only stacks additively with other increased attack damage uh, suffered sources like the one that it comes up over um, it comes up over here somewhere there's I believe it's 12 worthy foe which we'll get to later that's that's one of the unchanged nodes so let's just go through the changes that have happened here recover 25% of maximum life when you gain adrenaline this is amazing for some uses of adrenaline the last time I played a champion, I was triggering Adrenaline via using a Blood Magic linked aura, and so this actually wouldn't have helped me. What I was doing was, I'd be at 100% life, I would then flick on an aura while I was out of combat, but because it was linked to Blood Magic support, it would reserve, you know, 65, 67% of my life. So I dropped down from, let's say I had 6,000 life, I dropped down from 6,000 out of 6,000, to 1980 out of 6,000 with 4,020 life reserved. Uh, that's assuming 67% reservation. At that point, I'm at low life, and therefore I gain the benefits of adrenaline. I then flick off the adrenaline, and then I hit a life flask and I run into combat. That was how that build worked. And although that's clunky, adrenaline is so powerful that that worked. Recovering 25% of maximum life when you gain adrenaline doesn't actually help that use case. Uh, removing ailments and burning when you gain adrenaline is really nice, however, uh, especially if you've got a nasty bleed on you. This will save your ass if you've got a nasty, nasty bleed on you and it's starting to tick you down and then suddenly, boom, all ailments are removed. So various ways that you can use adrenaline. The baseline use case is just treating it as a better panic life flask because it's an automatic one. Uh, 20 seconds of adrenaline is incredibly powerful, but the effect, this way you have no control over when you get it. So you might get it just after, you know, just when you've got a boss down to 15% life. Uh, it then smashes you with a big hit. You go to low life, and then you've got, you know, you've got the adrenaline buff for the last 10% of the fight. Yeah, that's okay, but it's not amazing. Uh, you will sometimes get this, you know, this massive heal will sometimes help you, but other times you'll be knocked down to 40% with the first hit that you suffer. Uh, adrenaline doesn't kick in because you're not under 35%. 35% is a magic number for low life. So adrenaline doesn't kick in, the next hit comes in, and it's also for 60% of your health, and splat, you're at minus 20. You would at this point gain 25% of your, uh, recover 25% of your maximum life, except you're already dead. Now, that's one, that is one way that you can try to use it. Um, second option is the slow use that I mentioned before, uh, whacking on a blood magic aura. The third one, which is a very niche use case, is to reserve 59 to 64% of your life permanently. This is quite difficult to do. Uh, you need to either be using Chevron's wrappings uh, in order to cause chaos damage to be transferred to your energy shield, so that uh, chaos damage doesn't bypass energy shield. And then you need to be playing a duelist with an, an energy shield as your primary defense. This is difficult to do. Um, however, your other option is to have a lot of chaos resistance. If you do this, though, you can then cast a blood pack, oh, sorry, dark pact as a spell, which will then drain 6% of your life when you cast it. Casting dark pact when you don't have adrenaline will instantly give you adrenaline and fill up your life because you'll, be, you'll eat 6% of your health, 
but because you strategically reserve between 59 and 64 percent of your life uh, that will then put you down into low life and you'll immediately recover 25 percent of maximum life which is to full life uh, a couple of things that sound like they would work really well with uh, this first to strike last to fall node but don't it's not as synergistic as you might think with Val Righteous Fire or Righteous Fire, unfortunately. Uh, Val Righteous Fire, when you use it when you've got both energy shield and life, it drains all your energy shield first. So you need to have taken quite a beating for Val Righteous Fire to put you low enough to put you into low life, unfortunately. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's not amazing. Righteous Fire is also something that Righteous Fire will burn you down to to 35% health, at which point adrenaline kicks in, you recover 25% of your maximum life, and you remove the burning. Righteous Fire is a burn, so it does clear Righteous Fire, which is probably what you want. The problem is that you're in quite a bit of danger while you are using Righteous Fire and it is ticking you down. So if Righteous Fire takes you down to, say, 45% of your health, at that point, you don't yet pick up the adrenaline buff, but you haven't yet um, triggered the adrenaline heal either. If you're then smashed for 50% of your maximum health, well, you're dead. Uh, adrenaline can't save you. Definitely do not. Uh, I experimented with this on my last champion, and it was a hilarious failure. Definitely do not put cast while damage taken attached to Righteous Fire. Uh, that is a recipe for disaster. It's a hilarious disaster, but what will happen is you will... F the first time it will work the way you want it to work. Uh, you know, you'll take a hit, it'll trigger Righteous Fire, You'll burn down to 35%. You'll get a massive heal and a massive combat buff. You'll remove your burning. You feel like you're going great. Then you'll take another big hit, and that big hit will trigger Righteous Fire again, and you won't have any way to get rid of it. So yeah, don't do that. Do, however, feel free to laugh at me for doing so. Uh, next up in terms of changes, we have Inspirational. First up, this is not enough to turn a champion into a full function support build. Uh, a Guardian or a Necromancer or a Scion will still outclass the uh, support that you can provide as a champion. However, it's enough to be better than nothing if you've got a static group and no one wants to play as a dedicated support, or if you want to be a support character that can solo very well. 12% move screed is very, 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 very good. And there's a lot of other good stuff in this node. 15% uh, increased effect of non-curse auras from your skills. So that means if you were providing discipline, uh, instead of providing 300, or, you know, say 250 base energy shield, uh, you're now pro providing 287.5. Uh, banner skills reserve no mana. That's great. Whenever you create a banner, it gains 40% of the stages of your placed banner. I need to actually uh, look into the exact mechanics of how that works. What I think that means and I may well be wrong here, is that if you've planted a banner on the ground and it had 20 stages on it, uh, then you pick it up again to start charging it again. At that point, it jumps up to, uh, to eight charges immediately. But that's something I'd need to actually test because I don't think the wording is all that clear. You and allies affected by your place banners regenerate 0.1% of maximum life per second for each stage. 0.1% sounds terrible. The difference is, though, that... Um, this can stack 50 times. 5% of life per second regen is actually pretty significant. It helps your whole party as well. Again, it's something that's fairly solid. I still don't see myself taking Inspirational on many builds, um, but it certainly does offer something, something of merit. There will be people that take it. Uh, these people just won't be me. All right, so that's the changes. Let's just go through the old nodes quickly. Firstly, we have the Fortify cluster. Uh, four, Unstoppable Hero, and six, Fortitude. Unstoppable Hero is very strong, especially while leveling. 10% uh, increased attack speed and 30% increased attack damage while you have Fortify. 1,000 armor and evasion while you have Fortify, and can't be stunned while you have Fortify. Now, Fortify support has been something that in the past we've put on secondary attacks because it's had no damage multiplier, just an increased damage effect on it. And for that reason, its uptime was generally pretty high in combat, but not 100%. There's some talk that Fortify may be getting a more multiplier built into the gem. 
depending upon the numbers of that, uh, Fortify may be something that people use on their primary skills. We'll have to see. Uh, I'm not sure that we will, but let's just, let's just wait and see until the final numbers come out. In any case, uh, Unstoppable Hero has a very high uptime in general. And it's something that is a very powerful combination of effects. A thousand armor and evasion rating doesn't sound like much, but a thousand armor helps a lot against porcupines and other small repeated uh, attacks like tentacled miscreations firing their machine gun at you. And then the evasion rating is a small little bonus that will sometimes cause monsters to miss you. Nothing fantastic at end game. Those defensive stats are outstanding while you're leveling. And if you take this as your normal labyrinth, you will just feel incredibly strong. One of the, the big thing, though, is can't be stunned while you have Fortify. Being unstunnable is really strong. The end of the Fortify cluster is just simply permanent Fortify. This is a much less popular node, and I think it's quite weak, but it does have its fans. Melee builds do not need this, in my opinion. Uh, although some people do take it just for simplicity and safety's sake, uh, because it does guarantee you've always got Fortify. You don't need to worry about applying it in any situation. Um, I feel casters shouldn't be champions, so casters would benefit from having Fortify, but they shouldn't be champions because the ascendancy just doesn't offer them enough, even though Adrenaline works for them. And archers can, however, use this. If you're a champion archer, you probably should take Fortitude, uh, that is, in my opinion, it's, it's one niche use case. However, there, will be, there are people that disagree with me, and they, you know, certainly these people do know what they're doing, so don't rule it out. Next up, we have the Taunt Cluster. 10 Conqueror and 12 Worthy Foe. Uh, 10 Conqueror grants 100% chance, chance to taunt on hit. We'll come back to that in a sec. Uh, but 2% regen and 6% reduced damage taken is very good. Uh, this, is a, this is a quite potent defensive node. However, it does brick Decoy Totem if you ever use that for bossing. So just be aware that because you're taunting enemies on hit, enemies will be attacking you rather than your party if you're with, if you're with party members. And this is a mixed blessing. Uh, sometimes you want that to be the case because you're super durable, uh, but other times you've got some occultists that can take everything and you really are upset that you're taunting everything. However, this is a prerequisite for Worthy Foe. Uh, not just a prerequisite in that it's on the path to Worthy Foe, but also because the effects of Worthy Foe are heavily uh, gated by the, effect, the fact that you're taunting enemies all the time. Enemies taunted by you take 20% increased damage. This sounds like an increased multiplier, but again, it's an increase, it's a stat that affects the monster, and these stats are rare. This and Intimidate on uh, First to Strike, Last to Fall, these two effects together mean that enemies are taking 30% increased damage. This is a 30% more multiplier to all damage that you're dealing to, uh, the, uh, sorry, to all attack damage that you're dealing to that enemy. So that is really, really, really strong, those two nodes together. Additionally, enemies taunted by you cannot evade attacks. Uh, being unable to evade attacks is incredibly powerful, and this is the only ascendancy that basically gets it. I'm not going to call it for free. There is a big opportunity cost to taking Worthy Foe, but you probably would take this node anyway, and the fact that it gives you, uh, and enemies taunted by you can't evade attacks is incredible. So anyways, that covers all of the different nodes on the champion tree. Uh, let's have a quick discussion of some build ideas and some equipment ideas. So first up, you can still play after the changes. You can take any of the champion builds that were tried and tested in 3.6 uh, Synthesis League, in 3.5 Betrayal League, in 3.4 Delve, in 3.3 Incursion. Uh, all of these builds will still function today and some of them will have picked a little bit up. Default to taking four points in Taunt, so taking Worthy Foe, two points in Fortify, so that means that you're taking the Unstoppable Hero node, and then the last points, spend them wherever you want. I think there's a good case to be made for any of the remaining, any of the remaining choices. Uh, I'm not a fan of permanent Fortify, but as I said, I know that, uh, that I'm not 
that I'm not holding some absolute... I'm not some absolute unquestionable authority on that. And there are certainly people that really do like the Fortitude node a lot. Skill choice will need to wait uh, until we see the patch notes and the 2020 gems. But this ascendancy will be solid with any melee skill, except for ones that are reliant upon ascendancy granted charges. So don't lightly choose to try Tectonic Slam with this build. The thing that you really do notice about looking at this ascendancy is that it has no charge synergies at all in it. That's one thing that's, uh, that's a bit of a weakness, but there are other ways to generate charges. So you'll have to explore those yourself in order to get yeah, in order to get full benefit out of the champion ascendancy. The one thing that's become available though, uh, you can also look up Herald of Agony builds that are champions. Uh, they tend to use a bow, uh, use the Herald of Agony skill as a six link inside the bow, and then a four or five or, or six link in their chest that is a fast hitting, po a fast hitting and poisoning bow attack. Uh, I believe Reign of Arrows is very popular, but I'm not an expert on archer-type Herald of Agony builds. Herald of Agony, there's some talk that it may end up getting nerfed a little bit, though, so just keep that in mind if you're thinking about going that way. The thing that's newly available is Impale. Impale hasn't been strong in the past, but I think that the extra buffs that have been made to the Master of Metal side of things uh, may make... A Master of Metal Impale build something that is an exciting, newly viable way to play a pure physical damage build. Now, top tier pure physical damage weapons used to be extraordinarily expensive, and they still are. But the gap has been closed between accessible weapons and extraordinary ones. So, extraordinary weapons, you know, can deal, you know, you can have a one handed weapon dealing 600 damage per second as its uh, base tooltip, but accessible weapons can get up to the 450 to 500 range. And they're much cheaper than they used to be. I want to go through a couple of crafting methods you can use to make your own, uh, to make your own weapons for a, physical, uh, for a physical damage character, and just bringing up some information from a Path of Exile database, so poedb.tw. This here I'm showing specifically one-handed axes, but this crafting method will work for one-handed axes, for two-handed axes, for one-handed one -handed or two-handed anything. What you want to do is start with an elder version of your chosen weapon. So let's say you found an elder Gemini Claw that is of a suitable item level. You really want these to be item level 80 or higher if possible. And the higher the better, but obviously cost is a factor. Now, what you're going to be doing is fossil craft. You're going to take a shuddering, a jagged, and a serrated fossil. And if you can afford it, consider adding sanctified fossils. However, they, one, we don't know the maths of how they work. And two, they add considerably to the cost. Uh, sanctified fossils are pretty much never available cheaper than three to an exalt. So shuddering fossils bias towards getting more speed modifiers. Serrated bias towards getting more attack modifiers and Jagged Bias towards getting more physical modifiers. This is convenient because what you want on an extraordinary, extraordinary weapon is that it has physical damage, uh, that it has a percentage physical damage roll, a flat physical damage roll, and an increased attack speed roll. The reason that I suggested an Elder weapon uh, is because of all of these rolls that become available. Uh, increased physical damage, and socketed gems are supported by whatever. Brutality, melee physical damage, or ruthless. All these, um, you're mostly using these actually as redundant additional rolls in order to get high percentage increased physical damage. Uh, although the socketed, the free support gem may be useful as well. You're not gonna, no you're not gonna knock that, uh, but it's not actually the main reason that you're rolling it. Shaper would give you one of those, but Elder give you, gives you more. Additionally, Elder also gives you increased attack speed uh, rolls and also the bleeding on hit, which you don't have as much use for, and uh, increased physical damage, uh, increased physical damage while dual wielding if you're using two-hander. There'll be a little bit of, of variance between different weapon types here. The darker that the blue is that you see here, the more effects you have biasing you towards rolling that. 
So you'll notice here that this has attack and physical tags. There are two of these fossils, so jagged and serrated, that bias towards getting this roll. And so therefore it's more likely to you're more likely to get it. You still have to deal with the fact that sometimes you're going to roll squires. Sometimes you're going to roll polished. And so for that reason, don't expect this to be some miracle solution to get an amazing weapon every time. Uh, but it is a way that you can get yourself a powerful weapon reasonably cheaply. Something that you can use for a long time while you aspire to getting better. You may not be able to find these fossils yourself. Uh, shuddering fossils are fairly rare. Uh, but you will be able to trade for them from other players. Uh, you'll need to spend quite a bit of time in the Delve Mines to, to get them yourself. Next up, the other option that you can get is relies upon the fact that percentage increased physical damage is the rarest part of an extraordinarily good weapon. So you'll see here, uh, these, these data mined percentage chances to get these mods. You'll see here that there is a that the Vicious mod, tier 5 increased percent physical damage, is somewhat rare, but not, not staggeringly so. The Bloodthirsty mod is twice as rare, Cruel is twice as rare, Tyrannical twice as rare, and Merciless twice as rare again. So we're, getting, we're going from uncommon to somewhat rare, to rare, to very rare, to staggeringly rare. Rather than using Alteration Orbs or Chaos Orbs to try to force a weapon to have Merciless or... Um, Merciless or Tyrannical on it, what we're going to do is look into the various divination cards that exist for Merciless, one -hand, merciless weapons. So there is the Jester, which currently drops in Villa, who knows where it will drop in the future. There is Merciless Armament, which is in Armory and Colonnade, uh, at the moment, may be different by the time a Legion goes live. And there is a Tyrant from Precinct, and the Undisputed, which you will not be able to compile list yourself because it drops from Chaula. But that is four possible divination cards that you can trade for. Other players will own some of those cards. Uh, start with a set of those. Um, expect the Undisputed to be too expensive probably to use. And that's a starting point. Or you can start with a weapon with the Tacities prefix from the Incursion Temple Toxic Grove Room. Good luck farming this yourself. You will need it. I have done a guide on the Incursion... Uh, on the incursion mechanics if you miss those, and I will link it at this point. Now, don't try and use augmentations uh, on this weapon. What you want is just to start with the, just to start with only merciless, or maybe not merciless, maybe it's tyrannical, maybe it's cruel that you're settling for. And then regal the weapon. A null and hope, uh, unless you've got a good roll, a null the roll that you've just added on with the regal orb. Your goal here is to get a one mod rare weapon that has Merciless or uh, Merciless or Tyrannical or some powerful mod, or Tacities is great. However, if your Regal Orb put a powerful mod on it, like plus 21% to increase attack speed, then you do keep that one. Your next step is to multi-mod the weapon. This is a bench craft that costs two exalts and requires that you've beaten the Pale Council. And then add increased physical damage percentage from the bench. Oh, sorry, you've already got that. Add increased attack speed, add increased, uh, increased physical damage flat, one other suffix and one other prefix, and you have yourself a powerful, powerful, powerful weapon. So that is, a qu uh, that is two ways that you can craft yourself a... not so much a start of league weapon, but something that you can aspire to getting about the time you're moving into red maps, and it should be good enough to get to that should be good enough to carry you through to fighting Uber Elder. Anyways, that's all I've got to say on the champion at the moment. If you've got any questions, fire away. And otherwise, I will see you in game.